So once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's truly my great pleasure to welcome you here at the 13th uh, Annual CFA Society Forecasting Dinner 2015 in these magnificent halls of the Czech National Bank. A special welcome to Mr. Governor of the Czech National Bank, Miroslav Singer. I have compiled for you tonight uh, some uh, data from the Global Market Sentiment Study, which is uh, being performed every year by the CFA Institute. Uh, it seems that the, the only systematic trend which is present in, in those data is uh, the ever-increasing uh, uncertainty and actually unpredictability of the, of the events or, or the development of the markets. It's believed globally that the lack of ethics is accounting for some 63% or 63% of respondents believe that it's uh, one of the biggest issues in the financial industry globally. First, uh, welcome in, uh, in our premises. I will talk in uh, about three points. About, uh, first, I will briefly mention why, uh, again, why we uh, have uh, somehow using uh, uh, exchange rate as a tool of monetary policy. Then I will talk uh, briefly about what has happened to Czech economy after after uh, this uh, this move, and uh, then I will talk about uh, uh, our forecast and future risks and uncertainties. As I glimpsed uh, Hartzman uh, Hartzman uh, uh, research, I found out that probably most of CFA members uh, seem to support the move as opposed to. To readers of Fleetsheet final word. So, okay. So what we did, we we set up the floor, uh, one uh, one-sided commitment not to let the currency appreciate above 27 uh, crowns per euro. Initially, we thought we we will keep this policy uh, at least uh, for the whole uh, last year, and we said that the crown is to fluctuate as as it wants or as market wants uh, on weaker uh, levels than 27. And we did it uh, in order for, for, for to, to to whatever uh, monetary policy easing does for the economy, meaning supporting the growth and uh, and averting uh, fall of prices. But qualitatively, essentially, we have now uh, about three percent uh, faster growth than we had a uh, year and quarter ago. One percent of it max uh, could be attributed to. To growth in uh, of eurozone uh, and uh, fiscal impulse or plus minus yeah so we changed uh, in a sense we changed macro policies of this country in uh, in a growth supportive way uh, both on fiscal and, and monetary policy side okay what would have happened without this move that's a good question to ask and and you know as a forecasters it's uh, it's always easier to model what if scenario as soon as you at least know how the external factors developed so you can essentially take this with uh, with much more trust than the uh, than the forecast because the forecast is conditioned on many many things but but now we are modeling essentially get the growth of economy within uh, within the known external factors like uh, like situation in eurozone and and dollar uh, dollar euro exchange rate and so on and so on and uh, the black line essentially shows what would have happened without uh, without monetary weakening, and and you see the growth would be about uh, more than one percent lower. But uh, anyway, without uh, monetary policy weakening, we would have been in deflation for uh, for this and last year, and uh, inflation number would be very likely around minus two at this time, after 15, uh, 15 months in deflation. So that that would probably start influencing consumer behavior and investing behavior towards, I, I believe. I remember from last year that we discussed here whether we uh, are not trying to export our problem out. And uh, so I prepared this, uh, these two slides to, to answer this question uh, uh, in, a, in a structured way. And let me... Let me return back uh, to what, what has meant uh, exporting problem out. And uh, if you remember, deep in 70s or 80s, some countries due to too lax fiscal policy, essentially too much of fiscal impulse from the macro side, 
because their wages to grow so fast that they turned to be uncompetitive on a market and needed exchange rate to correct for this. Uh, that's, uh, and that's a column on the a, on a left-hand side. Uh. Our situation in late 2013 were completely opposite. We, we didn't have uh, growing wages at all. We had actually the lowest growth in uh, private sector ever. Uh, and we, uh, we underwent from 2010 to 2013 significant fiscal consolidation. So there was no fiscal impulse. But our problem was that we had completely depressed domestic demand. Eh? We had the investments falling for two years in a row and, uh, and consumers uh, saving increasing by, by, uh, by a rather dramatic number. So, so we didn't need to improve uh, foreign trade. Surprisingly, we had very nice foreign trade net result. And we needed to boost domestic demand. We didn't need to, uh, to boost uh, competitiveness or foreign trade data. And essentially this has happened. Yeah? The blue, the blue column is uh, our developments of uh, net foreign trade result by quarters. And you see they are, they are not changed significantly. And that was what, uh, what has happened. So we essentially really helped ourselves, not only through monetary policy, I must again mention the fiscal, fiscal policy impulse as well, but we helped to restore our, uh, our domestic demand. As to future, well, we are relatively optimistic. Uh, we believe the growth uh, should hover somewhere between Two, maybe two and a half and three percent. This uh, inflation that should uh, start moving up as soon as one year effect of lowering of price of oil will, uh, will get out of the data, which it will essentially after a year. And uh, well, of course, there will be siphoning out for a little bit longer into regulated prices, but, uh, but this is again going to be one, uh, one year effect. On the other hand, we are not that, uh, that optimistic on uh, PPI due to, due to both the oil effect itself, but also situation in, in Eurozone. In terms of employment, we should uh, get actually to quite nice uh, uh, data or, or figures in, in terms of unemployment for European country. And well, we are a country of balanced fiscal, fiscal sites and we, we expect to stay as such. As to our latest policy decision, well, we, uh, we essentially prolonged the, the expected uh, time of, uh, of uh, use of uh, exchange rate, of uh, floor existence, till, uh, till the second half of uh, 2016. On the other hand, we are, and I must say the risks are uh, significant, we are going still to, to watch for domestic demand and uh, any slump in uh, domestic demand or a renewed risk of deflation would, uh, would have to uh, cause us to, to change our exchange rate commitment. All right, well, let me summarize. So uh, first, we are bottoming out uh, the crisis. We are essentially now in a top third of uh, EU economic performers from the bottom third a year and something ago, which is great. We've been helped by, by, by essentially three factors, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and mild recovery in Eurozone. I must say milder than, than everybody expected a year and something ago. Well, uh, thank you for your attention. We would like to share with you the results of the uh, research or, or study which, which we've performed uh, on the Czech market about the Czech politics and uh, Czech economics how the respondents see the current situation. Uh, let me start with a slide which um, will most probably not be liked by Mr. Singer because the opinion of the respondents of this study is not um, so positive about the intervention of the Czech National Bank. An interesting detail of the results is that the financial experts are a bit more positive, according to nearly 55% of them, uh, the impact of the intervention was positive. My last slide is on anti-corruption measures. Nowadays, it is less than one in five. So you are less optimistic than it was the, uh, one year ago. Uh, interesting detail, once again, the VIPs uh, among the respondents are slightly more optimistic. And in 08, 
when the uh, uh, market makers deserted emerging markets and the corporate debt yields got up, uh, went, started going up, when they got to about 15%, we had a whole new range of investor base coming in, buying the assets. They were local investors. So what you have from emerging markets is diversity. You have a different perception of risk. You don't have this uh, herd-like mentality you get in the West. Real economic activity is 56%. Um, uh, purchasing, on a purchasing power parity basis, 56% of the global economy is now in emerging markets, the bulk, and growing fast. And these countries have enormous productivity uh, ahead of them. I believe Central Europe perception has changed uh, relatively dramatically. But uh, I also believe the Eureka moment for investor is, uh, is for uh, some over. Like uh, uh, in our case, we finance our sovereign debt uh, cheaper than France most of the time. We had even moments when, uh, when we finance ourselves cheaper than Germany. I was asked uh, just before the dinner whether the Czech Republic was, in my view, an emerging market. It's a very loaded question. But I immediately answered yes. And, and that's because of my definition of what an emerging market is. Um, for me, all countries are risky. Um, the phrase, by the way, risk-free, is an abuse of the English language. There is no such thing. Um, all countries are risky. Emerging markets are the ones where that risk is perceived, where it's priced in. And if we get to a position where the usefulness of the phrase emerging markets disappears, it'll be because we finally start pricing in the risks in developed countries. Well, I think the trouble with the markets uh, in Central and Eastern Europe are with how they are viewed. And they are viewed and managed by large portfolio managers in the US, UK, Western Europe. And they are still uh, following the dogma of the emerging markets being volatile. And when something's going to happen, then it happens in the emerging market. So regardless of the fundamentals and given the low volatility of the markets, uh, typically the, the local markets get hit uh, by the global macroeconomic uh, news more than the local fundamentals. After the Asia crisis, um, when, you know, depending on outside insurance, the IMF was seen as suboptimal by a lot of emerging markets. Emerging markets decided to self-insure. And to do that, they started building up central bank reserves. A number of exporters of oil also did the same thing at the same time. And you've had this enormous growth in reserves, such that today, 80% of global central bank reserves are owned by emerging market central banks. Emerging market central banks own about $11.5 trillion dollars in so-called liquid sovereign bonds from Europe and the US. And the sovereign wealth funds of these countries are another four or five trillion dollars. This is orders of magnitude more than any possible flow going the other way. So when people talk about in the press about possible flows out of emerging markets into the developed world, this is complete nonsense. In 20 years, 90% of cars in the world are produced and consumed in emerging markets. Pick another, pick another uh, good or service for that matter. Commodity markets are already the case. Emerging markets are already, and they are becoming more and more, price setters. Um, if you look at tick data in the US, uh, for the last 15 years, the major reason for holding up via the US Treasury market, the US dollar, is emerging market central bank purchases of US Treasuries. And they are overwhelmingly dominant now in the investor base for U.S. Treasuries outside the U.S. Yes, of course, central banks, the Fed has enormous uh, portfolio, but that's irrelevant when you think about the dollar risk. Because, of course, the U.S. has no uh, effective ability to intervene in foreign exchange markets because it doesn't have any foreign exchange reserves. This is a major global imbalance. It's, it's, it's created a completely artificial foreign exchange environment where emerging market currencies are about 30 or 40% undervalued compared to the dollar. Or put it another way, the dollar is massively overvalued. Um, so we have a world where we need prejudices because they enable us to uh, avoid thinking about difficult problems. My book, my message, is not an easy one. I'm saying that to complement your very fine CFA education, you need to supplement that. We're trying to introduce macroeconomics in particular, but also politics and history and anthropology for that matter, right in the center of your strategic thinking of asset allocation, not as an afterthought. 
and that's a CFA Institute Research Challenge, uh, which we are hosting uh, uh, already for the fifth year in, in the Czech Republic, uh, the regional round. Uh, in that uh, competition, the students of this year, really, again, record-breaking number of uh, 13 universities were uh, participating. And now the winning team is from the University of New York, Prague. Well, firstly, I would like to say that I really didn't expect to speak in front of all of you tonight, uh, so let me gather my thoughts. Um, Firstly, uh, we are still a bit overwhelmed by uh, winning among competition that was unprecedented in both uh, skill and number. Um, secondly, we are very grateful for the learning experience that it has provided us with, as well as the many other benefits, one of which is being here tonight among all of you. Um, we would definitely like to express our thankfulness to our industry uh, advisor, industry mentor, Mr. Michal Maraš, and uh, our faculty mentor, Mr. Tanvir Ali, uh, as well as, as the organizers who, who made it a really enjoyable and smooth experience. And uh, we are now looking forward to representing the Czech Republic and our university, the University of New York in Prague in Amsterdam. Thank you. Well, we would like to use this opportunity to present the Volunteer of the Year. As I mentioned, volunteers are absolutely essential for uh, the work of our society, uh, but uh, the Volunteer of the Year can be only one, and, and this year we would like to really thank and, uh, and award uh, uh, Tomáš Hrbáček uh, for his contribution to the society and especially for helping with leading the uh, in research challenge. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that concludes uh, our 13th annual CFA Society Forecasting Dinner 2015. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this year in, in so big number. I would like to really thank to the partners and, and sponsors uh, who are really helping us to make this event happen. Uh, without their support, it, uh, it would be simply impossible. Uh, first of all, the longest serving society sponsor, EY, who's been with us uh, since uh, 2002, the first uh, forecasting dinner we did. Also, thanks to CSOB Asset Management, ING Investment Management, who's uh, soon becoming NN Investment Partners, and to our new sponsor, PRK Partners. As I mentioned, our partners for PR and forecasting survey are DBM, Partners in Communication, and Hertzman Company. Media partners, Hospodářské noviny, uh, with their Ihnet Internet Portal and Econom Weekly, and Fleet Sheets Finder World. So thank you very much uh, again for coming, uh, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, and bye-bye.